Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Eve Udesky, and I'm the Program Director for Witness Theater at Self-Help Community Services. On behalf of Self-Help, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here to the conversation this evening. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to share a little background about the organization and the Witness Theater Program. Self-Help is the largest provider of services to Holocaust survivors in North America, and its mission is to serve as the last surviving relative to victims of Nazi persecution. Witness Theater, which originated in Israel, brings together a small group of students and Holocaust survivors to work together over the course of an academic year under the guidance of a drama therapist. It usually culminates in a live performance based on the survivors' stories presented to the public by the students and survivors together. Audience members witness the incredible stories of resilience and survival, but also the extraordinary bonds that have formed between the two generations over the course of the program. Self-help brought Witness Theater to New York in 2012 and has continued and expanded the program over the last eight years with ongoing support from UJ Federation of New York. This year, 30 students and 16 survivors across our three sites plan to perform for audiences at nine community and school performances. Unfortunately, the current coronavirus health crisis interrupted these plans. In mid-March, we had to suspend the program only weeks out from our final performances. The group at Yeshiva of Flatbush Joel Braverman High School, also our original partner on the project, immediately pivoted to create a beautiful tribute video in time for Yom HaShoah. It honored the stories of the survivors the students have come to care about so deeply and their work together. Tonight, we have the opportunity to hear from members of this group. I want to express our sincere thanks to UJ Federation of New York, the Sephardic Home for the Age Foundation, and the JFNA Center for Advancing Holocaust Survivor Care, all of whom made this year's program possible. A note before we begin, which I mentioned earlier, we will be opening the floor to questions from the audience in the second half of the program, and you can enter your questions at any time using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will also be sharing a link to the full video um, in the chat at the end of the session. Um, we'll also be recording this session so, so we can send it out after, after the fact for people who may have missed it. Um, without further ado, let me introduce to you our wonderful panelists. With us tonight are Yeshaya Rosenberg, a Holocaust survivor, and the 16 students who were with him in the program this year at Flatbush. I'd now like to turn it over to Sally Schatzkis, the drama therapist and theater director who facilitated this group. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm so, so pleased to be with you all here this evening and to see all my students and to see Yeshaya. And I'm really honored to be able to share what we're about to share with you, um, which is an up close and personal behind the scenes look into the process and the people behind Witness Theater. Um, as Eve said, we usually in a normal year, uh, we meet together over the course of the year and we culminate in a public live performance. This year, we pivoted to create a film that was able to be shown to thousands and thousands of people. Um, despite the fact that we ended in a very different way, this year has been as beautiful and as magical, perhaps even more so than any other year. And it is truly, truly my honor and my privilege to introduce you to Yeshaya and my students. Um, and before we open the floor and before we share a little piece of our film, um, and before you hear from all of my students, we're going to take a little bit of time to focus solely on Yeshaya um, and to introduce him, somebody who has become very close with him, so much so that he has assisted him in figuring out how to use Zoom and help get him onto the Zoom every time we Zoom with him, um, a student who's very close to all of us, Ricky Sasson. Ricky, go ahead. Yeshaya was born in 1928 in Deberson, Hungary. He had a normal childhood in a wonderful and religious family. He didn't feel much anti-Semitism until he was a young teenager 
and the government began passing laws that made life more challenging for the Jews. When the war reached Hungary in 1944, his family was forced into a ghetto, an overcrowded and closed off section of the town where 12,000 Jews were imprisoned. Soon after, he and his entire family were packed into a cattle car destined for the gas chambers of Auschwitz. Over seven decades later, Yeshai walked into the Yeshiva of Flatbush High School for his first session of Witness Theater. This is Yeshaya's story. You can tell Yeshai Rosenberg is a holy person just by looking at him. In his suit and black hat, he channels his famous rabbinic ancestry and simultaneously exudes status and humility. He drops precious life lessons into all of our conversations and we hang on his every word. Yeshai never dawdles. He walks with purpose and seems to always have somewhere he needs to be. He has told us many times that we are a stellar group of students and we take this comment very seriously as Yeshai is the type of man who can look right into your soul. Dear Yeshaya, as my world has shrunk to the confines of my home and my schooling now takes place within the four walls of my bedroom, I realize the importance of maintaining a healthy perspective. I am lucky to have learned that lesson way before this pandemic violated our lives, way back in September when I met you. In the last six months, getting to know you and hearing your story has taught me the importance of mindfulness and the beauty of every breath we take. It is because of you that I make an effort to cherish each moment, no matter the circumstance. These days, when I go for my daily solitary walk, I take deep, revitalizing breaths of fresh air. And it reminds me that my life, which seems to be restrained at the moment, is a true blessing. It reminds me of the life you had when you were my age, a life that literally almost rendered you breathless. Your family, like most Hungarian Jews, never thought the Nazis would reach your country. But in 1944, they invaded with bloodthirsty strength and barbaric intent. Suddenly, all you had known until that point was taken away from you, your home, your possessions, and your pride. After months of severely deprived existence, living with your family in the Deberson ghetto, your entire community was loaded onto cattle wagons to be shipped to Auschwitz. You didn't know it at the time, but mostly everyone was sent immediately to the gas chambers upon arrival. When it came time for your transport, you clung to your family amid the panic and confusion. Your parents, your beacons of hope, reminded you to breathe. As you boarded the packed wagon and the door slammed shut, you were enveloped in darkness and dread. No one knew where you were headed or how long it would take. Only a tiny window at the top of one wall offered any glimpse of your surroundings. The wagon was stifling, and after a few hours, the smell was unbearable. In the rancid air, you longed to take a deep breath, and those around you began to feel the same way. I can't breathe! Someone shouted. I can't breathe either. <laughs> Another echoed, and suddenly, a desperate chorus. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! I can't, I can't breathe. breathe! I can't breathe! I need to get to that window! One woman in the back cried as she clamored towards the tiny window. If we are going to survive, we all need to turn by that window! Responded a strong, more rational voice, and that is just what happened. In an astounding effort to keep everyone alive, the entire group in the wagon rotated together. 
giving everyone an ample chance to breathe next to the window. Miraculously, by way of some political negotiations that you never could figure out, your train was rerouted away from Auschwitz, and after 11 days in the wagon, you were finally let out in Vienna, where your family was transferred to a labor camp and eventually shipped to Theresienstadt. Your story continues on with many chapters and many near-death moments, but one in particular stood out to me as I readied to take on the role of your younger self for our performance. It was the chapter that happened just before liberation, when hardly anyone was alive anymore, and you were tasked with the job of collecting dead bodies onto a pushcart. Even today, so many decades later, you can still hear the last breaths of the helpless bodies that still lived as others were piled on top of them. If you could have, you would have breathed your own life into each one of them. My room suddenly feels freezing. I notice a large window that has been left open, and as I move to close it, I can smell the challah that my mother is baking downstairs for tomorrow's Shabbat dinner. I walk slowly down my carpeted stairs and out my cherry wood door into a world full of nature, beauty, and fresh air. Though I know I will never truly understand what you went through, I plan to honor you by making sure to live my life in a mindful way, with appreciation for every breath. This deep awareness and perspective that you inspired has taught me that each breath is a true blessing. With profound gratitude, Ricky. Yeshaya's entire immediate family managed to survive the war and they rebuilt according to their traditions, pious and scholarly. Yeshaya immigrated to America and has been living in the same house in Borough Park for almost 60 years, where he and his late wife Stella built their ever-growing family. Yeshaya never passes a day without attending a Torah class, and he uses a stationary bike in his house to stay healthy and keep his heart strong. His pride and joy is his family, and although they are scattered across the country, his grandchildren and great-grandchildren send him letters all the time. He makes sure to respond to each one of them, as they are his reason for living. They are on his mind each morning when he says, Modani, thank you, God, for the breath you give me at the start of each day. My name is Barbara Dayan, and I'm a student that got very close to Yeshaya over the year. We're so happy to have Yeshaya here today with us, and I'd like to share with you all that he is still so upbeat and doesn't let the current pandemic and quarantine interrupt his daily routine. He goes for a walk almost every day, visits with his family from his balcony, and goes to a, to a Zoom shiur every night at 7.45. He continues to inspire all of us through phone and Zoom calls. He just celebrated his 93rd birthday, and we drove by his house to visit him. Uh, we are all honored to call him our friend and our mentor. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Ricky. And um, it's moving, so moving to watch that clip again. I have seen it 100 times, and I could watch it 100 more. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, I urge you to watch it and share it. It is timely and it is also timeless. Um, so we're going to open up the Q&A for our attendees. If you have questions, please do start to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Before we start to answer any questions, Yeshaya, with your permission, I want to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, and ask you uh, a couple of questions. Are you up for it, Yeshaya? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. So, no Yeshaya, could you tell us a little bit about what it was like meeting all of these students this year at the yeshiva? What was this year like for you? I must tell the truth. I was, I think, I'm not used to uh, go to schools. I mean, especially only when I had to go to my children's uh, PTAs. I never missed a PTA, but now 
it's uh, 70 years later, and I was amazed about the student and the whole structure of the school. Very special children. Each one, the girls, the boys, they like children. They treat me like I'm a father of theirs. They call me how I'm doing. They come to visit me. They cannot come in because I'm a kind of virus, but they stay outside and they talk to me. They make pictures, but they wonderful children. I must tell, I'm very, I'm, I like to have nice children. I have my own wonderful children, great grandchildren. I have 54 great grandchildren. You can imagine. I'm busy. I had today visiting grandchildren, great grandchildren, yesterday, a day before, Sunday, every day. I said, my daughter calls me, I said, I'm so busy, I haven't got five minutes time for me. <laughs> but anyway, I was very impressed with the whole school, but all the students, and no question about the teachers, and the principal I met too, wonderful, special people. I'm, I, I'm, I think this is one of the outstanding schools a beautiful behavior, and besides, you know, to everything, to God, you know, and to people, everything, a mixture, a beautiful mixture. Okay, so I was very happy and glad to meet all these children. The boys, Ricky was always, and the girl was who was there a couple of times to visit me also. Barbara, I think, Diana came and not not a couple of girls. I don't remember all the names, but no, the faces, all of them. You know, they said from a great rabbi I heard once, he said, yeah, I have 400 students. I know all the faces and I know all the names. The only thing I don't know which face to which name. So I, I think I'm, <laughs> I also, uh, I don't have 400. But in my age, I, I can't remember everything, all the names, but the faces, definitely. Okay, so it, it was That's nice to see them all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Yeshaya. I'm going to that. Thank you so much. That was so, so beautiful. I'm going to come back to you in a minute, Yeshaya. So, so just hold there for a moment. Um, you know, you mentioned the students who've come to visit you. Um, despite the fact that there's this pandemic and that the program has ended and our students are moving towards graduation. Um, and really in all years, we encourage communication and interaction outside of the program. Um, we really strongly encourage it. And many, many, many home visits have been made and many families have opened their homes for Shabbat meals to survivors who have been in the program currently and in the past. And I'd actually like to ask one of my students, Diana, to speak about relation to how relationships continue after the program. And in particular, to speak about one, um, one of the participants this year, um, Sal Roth, who unfortunately, unfortunately we lost just days after our film aired. Diana, would you speak to us about the continued relationships after the program? So, even before the coronavirus started, while we were still part of the pro go as part of the program, I made it my business to visit Saul every every week, every Monday. Um, I would take a few people to his house, maybe take a cake or two, um, and I thought it was very important to get to know Saul in specific on a more deeper level, more than just in school. And I think that. I t so I took different people each time. Sometimes I would take friends and different family members to visit because I thought that visiting and showing other others how the relationships that I've made with these survivors are. Um, and also during the coronavirus, um, when, when it started and we were unable to meet with the different the survivors every week, I tried to call everybody um, and see how they're doing and to, to just keep in touch a little more because of the fact that now we can't see them. I thought maybe it was important to, to call. And also, um, last week I went to visit Yeshaya. He was on his uh, balcony and me and my mom and my sister, we went to visit and we said hi from the street and it was very nice. I think it was just very important to 
um, to keep in touch, even though the, we can't really see them in person. Thank you so much, Diana. Yeah, it, it's, uh, um, it almost feels more urgent now to stay in touch because our elderly are, are so uh, isolated these days during the pandemic. So the phone calls and the, the socially distant visits are, are even more critical now. Um, so thank you for, for sharing, Diana. Yeshaya, I'm gonna come back to you because we've had a few questions for you. And one of the questions that repeated itself um, is about your source of strength both during the war and now during this pandemic. Yeshaya, where do you find your strength? How did you find your strength to rebuild after the war and to survive during the war? I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed that not only me, myself, but a lot of the survivors, somehow they put in such effort to rebuild, it's unbelievable. I was a student. I went uh, from Hungary to Czechoslovakia right after a, a less than a year after when we came home. And I was a lot of times after, I mean, since the Holocaust, I was alone. So when I came here with a group of yeshiva boys in, in the United States, and then we had to study a couple of years. After that, we had to make a living. They saw that uh, the rabbi and the principal and everybody talked. This is a different time. 70 years ago, there was no, they say, PhD. Pop has dough. No, there was nobody. There was no pop. There was no dough, no money. I had to go to work. I made 75 cents an hour. And I said, I am here alone. I have to eventually get married. How do I make a living? I have to go to work. And I went the first day, they offered me a job, and I said, I'm going to try. I didn't even know what the job is. I was so nervous, if I excuse myself, but I was on the street vomiting. I was so nervous. And I came to the place, and they, say, they, they saw a, a, a young, young fellow. He said, don't worry about it. We're going to try to teach you. And I was uh, trying the best always put my best effort. They should be happy, they should be satisfied with me, I should make a tremendous good job, whatever I can the most. But then I was successful, I made the nice wages, and then I uh, got independent with a partner or so, and then uh, I got engaged, and a beautiful family, also she, my wife was, a granddaughter of the chief rabbi of Vienna before the war, and uh, very famous, uh, distinguished family. And uh, she was really beautiful inside, outside, and she did, and she raised beautiful children. My children behaved. My neighbors used to say, I didn't even know that you have three boys. They're behaving. My wife said, just for a, a short, I said, it's Saturday, everybody's working the whole week, and they lay, lay down till five o'clock. You cannot go out and play and make noise. You have to behave. And that's how they brought up my children. They're all wonderful, excellent, well-behaved, well-learned, and very respectful children. And grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I want to have the best. I said, when I, one of my grandchildren, son got married, not married, got engaged. I said for the uh, bride-to-be, for the car, I said, you know, we have the best and we are getting the best. That's what we do. Okay. Thank so, you. Uh, I talk another 15 minutes, but I think it's enough. Thank you, Yeshaya. You know, one of the things that I always say to my students is that no matter how much time we spend together, we will never be able to get the full scope of the story or hear all the memories or learn every detail about every person. Um, so I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn the, I'm going to turn the um, floor over to one of my students now. One of the questions is, 
what was it like to um, interview to interview Yeshaya? But that question is really, what was it like to interview any of the six of the Holocaust survivors who participated in our program? Um, so I'm going to turn the floor over first to Ricky because um, if you could speak about interviewing Yeshaya and how Yeshaya's strength and faith has changed your life. And then for my other students, I'd like you to think about that question as well. And I'll call on somebody um, when Ricky's finished. Go ahead, Ricky. Yeah, so um, of course the learning process has its ups and its downs when you're speaking about a topic of this sort. But really particularly in Yeshaya's case, um, as we were learning his story, it would never simply be the story, but he would constantly make sure to infuse the information with the fact that he's gotten through it and with lots of hope um, and lots of determination, Yeshaya, who embodies hope and perseverance, um, managed to build his uh, beautiful family that he talks lots and lots about and is very proud of. Um, so really, I mean, Yeshaya handed me an easy one because he is truly inspiring, even talking about everything that happens and while he was going through it. Thank you, Ricky. Um, for the other students who would like to speak, just go ahead. Perhaps I'll call on. Noam, can you speak about um, Ted? And yeah, Ricky? sure. I was gonna say something about faith uh, before I was gonna say, you know, the other thing. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, okay. so I'm Noam Weinstock and I, I work closely with the different survivor we had as a part of the program, Tibor Kupristin, or as we got to know him, Ted. And our focus was on how religious freedom impacted his life and how his struggles through the war. And when I sit in my house and I do the, you know, the regular religious practices that we would normally do, like saying Shema or praying, and I have to do that in my room now, I think of how much of a polar opposite Ted's life was to mine right now. Even if, you know, we're stuck in our house, Ted told me he went on one death march and he told me how he had to say Shema to make himself feel comfortable. He said Shema out loud to himself, not out loud, but so nobody would hear him. And he said Shema and it was cold and he felt like his body would just crumple because of the, the conditions he was in. They were marching all the way from one death camp to another and he just felt like God was his last hope. God was the last person he could turn to. And just in the cold, turning to God, saying Shema with all his heart, I feel how much of a polar opposite is it, it is right now. I'm sitting in my room. I have heat. Even with all this coronavirus happening, I have a family right next to me. I have my whole family here. And I'm glad to say that I can turn to my family and I can also turn to God. And no one will say anything about that to me. No one will tell me I can't. And I have all the freedom I want, even if I just have to sit here by myself and say it, just like Ted was on that march. Thank you, Noam. Uh, do you want me to say the, the other part or should I say um, that? Let's hold off for a minute because I want to piggyback on what you just said. Yeshaya, someone um, is asking um, how you were able to maintain your faith in the midst of the war and living through um, the, what the Nazis did to you and to your community. And did you ever have doubts about God? So, Yeshaya. Not, not really. Not really. Uh, you know, in the camp, when we were working, I think we, it was Yom Kippur, and we were working. And we came home, I don't know, we were fasting, but we were fasting God every day. You know, they gave you so much food, they gave you a little bread, maybe about, I would say, uh, four inches in the width. And that was for a whole week. And I was with my younger brother, 
every she said, okay, today we have to eat one's rice. We took us rice, that was good for one teeth. So we took a second one, third, we ate up the first, first day the bread. Came the next day, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> what happened, we were fasting. But we have to take it, we didn't have no other way, to, no choice. And uh, that's, what it, that's what it was, you know, our family was very, uh, I'm talking back, my father and my mother and my grandfather, both, and my great-grandfather, they were all very strong believers. They were leaders in the community. And one of my grandfather's uh, son, you know, he passed away about uh, 125 years ago. 125, he passed away. And his tomb is written that he was famous all over the world. Now, at that time, there was no uh, internet. There was no Zoom, no Skype, and uh, but he spent he he printed books, you know, like he uh, authored very very uh, heavy set books for the Jewish world, and he was famous all over the world. And my grandfather, my father, were very beloved, exceptional, exceptional. Today, if I look around, I I I can't. Very, very hard to find somebody matching, matching their knowledge and their behavior and their belief and their pureness and their holiness. That's what it was. So I grew up for me uh, in that respect. It was not such a big challenge. It was more a challenge rather the food <laughs> than the belief. <laughs> wow. It's, you know, it's amazing to hear Yeshaya speak. We've been meeting with him every week for the whole year, and I'm still blown away everything that he says. And he says new things every time. And even if he were to say the same thing every time, it has different meanings um, all the time. And, and particularly in this time of life, the lessons that we've learned and the people that we met this year have truly changed, um, changed our lives. And um, I'd love to ask um, to my students, this is actually a couple of questions put together. Um, the first question is, how did meeting the survivors change your life? How did being in this program change your life? And we've heard a little bit about, about that from some of you, but how did being in this program change your life right uh, prior to the pandemic during the pandemic and the choices that you intend to make um, when the world gets back to normal. You know, for, for those of you who aren't aware, all of these students and all the students who are in Witness Theater are seniors in high school. So they are going to college next year or to a gap year in Israel and they are taking with them this experience. And I'd love to hear you speak about how this has changed your life and your life moving forward. Um, so you can just put up a hand if you want me to call on you. Otherwise, I'm actually going to ask. Okay, sure, Esther. Go ahead, unmute yourself, Esther. Um, hi, uh, my name is Esther Spiegel. And um, being in Witness Theater really did impact me in different ways. Um, one way I'd say is that um, a few years ago, my last grandparent passed away. And when I walked into Witness Theater the first day, like I felt that I being six new grandparents and the things that they tell us besides their stories like their lessons um they're definitely things to learn from and it was really like a great honor to be a part of the program thank you esther um just put up a hand go ahead elizabeth Yeah, hi, my name is Elizabeth Najjar. And um, just to add on to what Esther said, um, immediately when we walked into the room on like the first day, it was just, everyone seemed to click. Like we were all nervous going in, not knowing how this was gonna turn out or what to expect. But it was as if we, we gained like new grandparents. Everything just flowed between us. I mean, we learned so much from each of them. 
their stories and not only that, just life lessons that, that we're going to take with us and have with us for the rest of our lives. And I think we're all just really appreciative of this experience and everything we got to learn from them. So I just want to mention that one of the questions is how we intend to pass the stories on and what, um, what you just heard from the students is very significant because um, when you hear somebody's story one time or when you read a book, it's much easier to forget or to be very passionate about sharing it in the moment, but then to get busy with other things. In the Witness Theater program, we spend an entire year getting to know the survivors who are in our program. And when I say getting to know them, it's getting to know their, their entire lives and personalities, not just the stories from the war. And so when you have a grandparent, you feel responsible for their legacy. And so when the students um, started to feel like these wonderful adults were their grandparents, it, it is not, is no longer a question of will we pass on their stories, but more of how will we pass on their stories and when can we pass on those stories. We're waiting for those opportunities, we're looking for those opportunities, and many, many alumni of this program have committed to um, writing down stories, logging poems, visits that um, to, uh, to, categor to put um, categorized photos, uh, genealogy, putting together photo books, so many different ways to help carry on their stories because we, we love them as our own family. And that's why this is a very different form of Holocaust education and one that runs very, very deep and lasts very, very long. For my students, feel free, you know, we, we do have something planned to say, but if I say anything that you want to respond to, um, just go ahead and stick up a hand and I'll call on you. Claudine, go ahead. So I was going to say before, when you mentioned about like post pre-corona and post like our feelings and everything, right? Is that something you asked? Um, I think like the show's theme, Ordinary Blessing, really just shows exactly how we've been feeling because before Corona, like I'm hearing all these stories, uh, not before Corona, before Witness Theater, before I got to know all these amazing survivors and hearing their stories, I didn't realize that the small things actually are just really ordinary blessings. And especially with Corona, we got to see all these things being taken away from us that we would never thought. And like, obviously I know we can never relate to the, what they went through, but you can see a little bit like, feel a little bit of what um, they felt and they had things taken away from them that you would never expect. Yeah, this is a very unusual um, year for us to be going through this and for us to have been part of this program and very relevant. Um, I just want to go back to a question. I mean, we're, we are speaking so much about what we learned and how our lives have changed. Yeshaya, I want to come back to you and ask you a question. What is, um, what is your wish for these students as they move into the future? What is your wish for them? What is your blessing to them? What is your hope for them? You, you're, talk, you're asking me about the children? What do, you, what do you wish for them? What do you wish for all of these students? First of all, I wish them luck in their whole life. A blessing for God, but we, if people, we can say, we can uh, wish them also, but everything has to come from God. And uh, if Hakur Baruch gives you strength, and you should try always the best and do the best to people and to friends and to everybody. I like people. I have no uh, complaint about anybody. Uh, I, I never did anything wrong to anybody. I, I don't say I, some of them I helped, some of them I'm not, but nothing ever, ever wrong. So they, you know, they say a story in the Bible, uh, they say that uh, a, a, a converter came to Hillel and he said, tell me in one word, how can I 
keep the whole total. So he said, whatever you don't like for yourself, don't do for anybody else. Not to have to rachel kumachel is already a higher degree. That means you should love somebody as you love yourself. That's a little harder. But if you say, don't do anybody any wrong as you don't wish for yourself. So that's not so bad. It's easy to take it. Don't do anything wrong. You do bad, to bad, it's no good. To be helpful, surely it's better. But if you don't do anything wrong, it's also a milestone. But you can be, you know, it's very nice to helpful. It's amazing in this uh, COVID-19, what people, they, you know, they're in the first, first uh, stage people and nurses and this, it's amazing. It's, you know, like they give their life. It's a question of, of, of uh, survival and they do that. So it's amazing to see that some people, they are very nice. And so should be. You should always be nice to people. You're going to be successful. If you like people, people are going to like you. Thank you. It's so, I hear from the students that in their saddest moments, in the moments when they really need to find comfort from somewhere, they call the adults from our program. And that's where they gain their strength. And that's where they gain their comfort and their courage. And what an amazing two-way street of encouragement and love and strength. It's, it's truly amazing. Um, you know, the question of what do you wish for the students comes up very often. We have a lot of ritualistic closures at the end of each session. We meet once a week. We meet every Wednesday night for two hours at a time. We have a dinner. We have dinner together in the middle of those two hours. And the question often comes up, what do you wish for the students? Or if you could bless the students with something, what would it be? So I'm um, actually gonna, um, if someone wants to respond to that, go ahead and put up a hand. Um, but I, I'd like to actually call on Stella because Stella, we, Stella um, was assigned the role of one of the women in our group named Bella. And Bella was often wishing things for us. And she was often taking our hands in hers and, and um, making many wishes for us. And Stella, I'd love for you to speak a little bit about your experience learning from Bella and, and being the recipient of all of, of her wishes. Thanks, I'm Stella. Um, so with Bella, she really did like to bless us a lot. I think in the end of the day, she really wanted our life to be better. She really wanted us to have a lot of the opportunities that she didn't. So. She talked a lot about things that involve like her theme of home a lot of times, baking, um, hanging out with our family. She really wanted us to not be rushed as she was during her childhood. A lot of times in her story, she was running and running and running. And she really wanted us to be comfortable. I also think because of her blessings, we got very close in a way where she knew a lot of things about our life. Um, she always asked us about college, we were seniors, we were applying. She asked about what was happening that week, what was going on, if we had a presentation or something, oh, did it go okay? She really just wanted the best for us, kind of like a grandparent, like they said before. Um, and it really just showed us how much she cared about us, and I think that's really special. Thank you. And Stella, one of the things that we also, um, we also do during the year is we invite um, witness theater um, participants, the adults, from this year and from previous years to come away with us on school Shabbatons. And, um, and, and on those Shabbatons, it's amazing to, look, to watch them see hundreds of Jewish children celebrating their Judaism and singing about their faith and, and, and just freely, openly, publicly declaring their love of, of their education and their faith and their God and their Judaism. And Danielle, I would love for you to speak about what it's like, um, what the adults have shared with us and blessed us with, um, because they tend to express their wishes for us very often on these Shabbatons because they are usually, they're overwhelmed by 
the amount of Jewish children that they see congregating at these weekends. And these are students who are not in the program. This is one of the ways that Yeshiva of Lapush has expanded the program so that many hundreds more students can be exposed to the people and the, to the stories. Hi, I'm Danielle. Um, so on the Shabbatons, we do sessions where the survivors share a small part of their stories to the students. And it's amazing how many students are so interested in hearing it. The, the sessions are fill up so quickly on one of the Shabbatons they had to make an additional session because of how many, because of, because really it, it's, because, sorry, um, the students are really very interested in hearing this. And um, even the survivors, what they've said is they can't believe how many students are coming to them and asking them questions. And sometimes they ask, like, do they really want to hear this? Um, should I really be telling them this? And we always tell them, like, yes, we, they want to hear it. They, they're so interested in learning all about you. And, um, and at the end, we always urge the survivors to give the students blessings. And they just want us to really appreciate everything and to, to, um, to really just to tell our families that we love them and, to, and just to do a lot, all the things that, they, that was taken away from them that they couldn't do. Thank you, Danielle. Just for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term Shabbaton, a Shabbaton is a weekend away, uh, like a retreat, a weekend retreat where we celebrate Shabbat together. And it starts on Friday afternoon and goes through Sunday afternoon. And we've had many, many, um, many, many Holocaust survivors attend these programs with us and they come away for the full weekend. And it's pretty um, beautiful and pretty intense because we're all together for 48 hours in a hotel and we stay up very late. and have a lot of really beautiful conversations. Um, I wanted to just address this question. What are the challenges, uh, what challenges are present that limit the other survivors from participating in this Zoom conference call? Um, and that th those are just purely technical challenges that they don't have computers or don't have cameras or don't have um, ability to be on a Zoom. And we do have Zooms with them calling in, um, but we thought it would be very nice to have, um, to, to have everyone be able to see Yeshaya. And in the future, um, we hope we can have more of these and we can have an, an audio only, survivors on audio only, but we thought it would be lovely to, for everyone to be able to see Yeshaya's face. Um, I just wanted to, uh, Stella, go, you had a, something you wanted to say? And then I'm going to ask Bonnie to speak about some of the ways that we respond to the difficult content of the stories that we hear in Witness Theater during our sessions. Go ahead, Stella. So I was going to say, in addition, as far as technical difficulties, Zoom is rather new technology in their um, mind. So it is uh, explained to them how it works and for them not to be confused in that sense, um, to get them on. It is, like it doesn't seem so complicated to us, but I know even like my normal grandma, my actual grandmother, um, when we try to get her on FaceTime, it's quite challenging as well, so. Right, right. So we, we do try, um, but we only, we will try only as far as um, we can without creating any kind of frustration, um, because at that point, it's just we should just use the phone um, instead of uh, creating any kind of frustration. Um, Bonnie, would you speak a little bit, you know, in, in Witness Theater, we share a lot of emotions. We share a lot of laughter, but we also share a lot of tears. And as you can imagine, when we get into the real crux of the program, um, we hear a lot of very intense stories. And Witness Theater offers us a uh, creative way to respond and and in this way it makes again witness theater a very different form of holocaust education and bonnie i'm going to ask you actually bonnie hold that thought for a moment frida if you could just share with us because before we even get into the sharing of the stories we have a whole six to seven weeks at the beginning of the year that we dedicate to just creating the bonds of a family um, we do a, play a lot of theater games and we have share a lot of laughter and, and get to know each other. 
Frida, can you speak a little bit about the beginning part of the program? And then we're going to get to Bonnie, who's going to talk to us about the real crux of the stories. Hi, my name's Frida. Um, so the beginning of the program, for the first couple of weeks, we don't even start, we don't even speak about, you know, like the the Holocaust, their ex like the survivors' experiences. Sa like one of the first things that Sally tells us is they're not, don't call them survivors. They're not, that's, they are survivors, but that's not what defines them. They're, call them adults. That's what you should refer to them as. And so we do, and I think it was for me one of like the most, like it was one of the biggest things for me because it's like, they are survivors, but they really are like, they're like our friends, like our grandparents. There's such a sense of respect that, that, that's there from the first day. And it's crazy because you would never think that such like, there's such a big age gap. Like how could we get along so well, but we, we do, and it's beautiful. And in the beginning, we don't talk about it and they think, oh, that's what I'm here to talk about. But, but we, we don't talk about it at first. It's just, oh, let's get to know each other. Uh, how big is your family? What do you, what you guys used to do for a living? Like, like simple things like that. And it just, we get to know each other on that, like on a personal level, and then we can get into the deeper, the deeper information that ends up going into the show. Right, and and one another goal in those first six weeks is warming everybody up to the, the idea of what we call embodiment, which is to take a story or a moment or a thought or a feeling and put it on its feet visually, act it out. So Bonnie, can you share with us a little bit about what that looks like in a session? Yeah, hi, my name is Bonnie Malamed. Um, I think that in the beginning when they started to share their stories with us and they would explain to us very, very difficult moments in their life, a lot of us as students, we, we had like a, just a student talk and we said that sometimes it was hard for us because there was a disconnect in us not being able to really like imagine what they went through. So something that helped us understand what they went through was embodiment, like which is us asking them to just open up their feelings and make them very vulnerable and ex have them explain to us a specific moment in their past that is hard for them even to just explain in words. Sometimes it's not even the words that get us to feel closer to them. It's just like here, one story, a, an adult that I got clo close with, Rochella, she told us the story of how her sister and her, after her mother and her grandmother passed away, um, a woman took them in and she explained to us that every morning she woke up and she felt like she was in an unfamiliar place. And when she told that to us, Sally had two girls lie down and, and um, act out that scene. And so when we acted it out, we kind of had Rochelle explain to us her feelings and how she dealt with that moment and then it kind of made the disconnect a little smaller yeah and it's it's really really amazing to watch the students develop what we call somatic empathy which means that they can feel in their bodies that they are ex actually experiencing in their bodies what the person who's telling the story was feeling and and in this way there is such a deep level of connection because these adults are watching their own stories being played out by the youth of the future. And there is no better way to say to them, we heard you, we love you, we will pass on this story, than to actually act it out in our bodies and to commit to putting that on a stage for the would-be audiences. And so you, you see a piece of that in our film, and each one of these students who you see today was going to play one of these survivors or one of the significant people in their lives. And that is the greatest gift that we could ever give to them. Um, and it's truly, truly an honor to be able to facilitate that process. Um, I believe that we have to start wrapping up, although we could go on and on because it is truly a deeply layered program. And, um, and um, I just, Eve, if you don't mind, just want to ask Solomon to very, very briefly, Solomon, could you tell us what made you want to be in this program? What was it like? Because there's a general sense for most of the students who got into this program. And if I can be so um, um, 
if I can say, this is one of the most highly coveted programs and the most selective programs at our school. And we have at least a third of the grade applying every year, which is a testament to the caliber of students we have at Yeshiva Flatbush. But Solomon, what made the 16 of you want to be part of this program? You're not actors by trade. Many of you have never been on stage before. Tell us very briefly. All right, so I want to thank everybody uh, for coming out, everybody that's on the, uh, the call right now. But um, to answer that question, basically, I think it's like a, at first, it's more of, for me specifically, personally, um, you know, being an Ashkenazi Jew, it kind of connects to my roots um, more significantly than overall as a Sephardic Jew. And in my family, somewhere down the line, there was like some problems there. Like some of my ancestors were, you know, unfortunately like murdered by um, Nazis or uh, Germans in, during that time period. And uh, like my grandma used to mention it, like she mentioned it here and there, like once in a while um, when I asked. And then always like seeing this program year after year and just the fact that our mentor, Ms. Shotsky, is like she always, you know, she always, um, she brought this to, I think, America. And it's very like special program, like in general, it's very, and I think when you, when you keep going throughout the program, you realize that you realize more why you came, like we said in the beginning, you don't really, you're not doing the play stuff. You're just getting to know the actual people. And you, I, you could see the connection from the years before. And I've seen like previously year after year, there's always new, innovative, creative ways that the shows kept going on and on. And they just got more interesting by the year. And it just always felt like something that, okay, I got into the high school. This is one of the, the, um, opportunities and uh, extracurriculars that they offer I've got like that's it wasn't even it was a no-brainer it was just check off the list I gotta apply for that I have to at least try because it just like you could see how special it is just just from I'm sure everybody watching the video this year or if you've seen previous um, plays or shows that um, Witness Theater has put on it's like a very special thing I think um, everybody I can speak for everybody here that you know it's it's it gets the purpose is you realize the purpose much more once you join the program and you see exactly why you why you um, applied even if you were a little iffy on it at first which wasn't my case but just in case um, I think by the end of this everybody is definitely um, you know captivated and they yeah. love this program. <laughs> Thank you, Solomon. I d just want to sure. clarify I did not bring it to America I brought it to the Yeshiva of Flatbush which is really um, uh, which is my alma mater, and I couldn't be more proud to have done that. But I'm going to use that as a segue to Eve from Self Help, who did bring it here, who did pilot this program, and without uh, self help, <laughs> no, 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 without self help, Credit, um, Eve. and there are self help staff members and Yeshiva Flapper staff members in the room at all times. And without that partnership, this program could never happen. So on that note, I'm going to turn the floor over to Eve. Yudesky from Self Help. Again, Eve, a public expression of gratitude from all of us at Yeshiva Flatbush to Self Help. We make magic together and we hope to do this until we can't do it anymore. And vice versa, Self Help to Flatbush. We are, you know, you are our original school partner on this project eight years ago. And I have to give a shout out to Adina Harwitz, who's not here, but is really the person at Self Help who was instrumental in bringing Witness Theater here eight years ago. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to the students. Thank you so much, Yashaya, for giving us your time, for being here with us, and really for participating in the Witness Theater program and sharing your story. Um, it's really an honor to have you. Um, and I just also want to add that we do have two other groups um, that were running this year. One was a group at Self-Help that was both Jewish and non-Jewish students throughout the metropolitan area. Um, and another one was at that Abraham Joshua Heschel School on the Upper West Side. And both of those programs are working to create videos of their own for their groups to honor their uh, group their survivors and the adults in their groups their stories as well so please look out for that um, and for more information about witness theater you can visit and self-help please visit our website uh, the the witness theater page um, is in the chat 
also on the page right now is the Ordinary Blessings video, which this group created and you saw a clip of tonight. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again, Sally, um, and all the panelists. Thank you very much. Nishaya, special thanks to you. It was so wonderful to have you here tonight. Thank you for joining us, Yeshaya. Okay, we are finished with the program now. We're finished. Thank okay, you all so, so much. everybody, a uh, lots of luck and Thank a happy you. holiday. Amen. Don't forget, it's coming holiday. You have to keep smiling and keep on smiling and smiling. The Abbey said, God will send us the best. Amen. We, yeah, okay, Amen. you are great ch children. I'm telling you, I'm very proud to have in Clary so such nice a group of, of of teachers and a group of students. It's a, they say Lo Alman Israel. That means Israel is never uh, weak. We have always the best. And you are one of the future best. And we wish you a lot of luck. And uh, never come to such such a degree what we went through. But that's what it is. You know, we can't we can't have we have to take whatever we get from our Kodishba. That's it. Okay, so have a great holiday and enjoy it, all of you children. Uh, I, I wish I would remember all the names, but beautiful. Have a great holiday and you, Sally, great, great uh, holiday and all the best. Thank and you, keep in, keep in touch once in a while. Yeah, absolutely, uh, definitely. Absolutely. Uh, unbelievable. They are like my children. They come to visit me. Unbelievable. They call me how I'm feeling. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So have a great day and a happy holiday. Happy and holiday. Happy, we should meet always on happy occasions. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Be all the best, girls, children, girls, boys. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you, Shaya. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye, Shaya. Bye, yeah. Shaya. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Ah.